perfect condition, just like you left it. Now there's some other shit you might need. Overflowing with style, dripping in imagery, and rife with references to the early 1980s, Mandy is as pulp as fiction comes. Its cosmic energy, over-the-top lighting, and gore-fest finale are all reasons to like it, but it's Nicolas Cage's amazing performance that made me love it. You're a vicious snowflake. Every single frame throughout Mandy oozes style, all of which amalgamate in truly nailing the galactic heavy metal aesthetic that inspired it. This influence is rampant from the book Andrea Riseborough's Mandy Reads, the battle axe and the black skulls, to the brief glimpses of animation and the cosmic skies which close out the film. Talking about the movie, director Panos Kosmatos said that he wanted it to feel like a disintegrating rock opera, and it shows. You need to look no further than the heavy metal album covers from the 1980s to see the visual influences in the film's design language, from the demonic forms, cosmic skies, to the aggressive colour palette. Most simply, we find this translated effectively into the film's incredibly brief segments of animation that adopt the styles of classics like heavy metal, with similar bold colour schemes, movement, and those iconic deep endless skies. The film brings these aesthetics firmly into the 21st century, with cinematographer Benjamin Loeb dousing almost every single frame in bold hues, most often crimson reds and dizzying deep purples, a feature turned up to 11 during Mandy's forced hallucination. I'm sorry for all this fuss and muss. While these visuals jump out through strong, unique techniques, it would be amiss to not mention the unbelievable score from the late Johan Johansson, whose music adds a level of refinement that helps balance some of the campiness. What are you drawing? Uh, it's kind of like um, a jungle temple. Oh, that's just, I mean, that's just, wow. Oh. Set in the Mojave Desert's heavy metal sounding Shadow Mountains in 1983, the film centers itself on a loving couple living in a small town, the titular Mandy Bloom and Red Miller. Although the surface may seem warm, our characters are haunted by dark pasts. Red is a war veteran harboring all demons, while Mandy has some foggy residue left from a traumatic childhood. Fortunately, the couple managed to mobilize these histories into their everyday, particularly through Mandy's cosmic art, which the two revel in. That is, until one day, while innocently walking to work at their store, Mandy is spotted by the Children of the New Dawn, a deranged hippie cult led by failed musician Jeremiah Sand. Sand becomes obsessed and orders his followers to bring Mandy in. Obedient disciple Brother Swan obliges, calling a group of demon bikers, the Black Skulls, to do their dirty work. These Hellspawns, awfully reminiscent of Hellraiser's Cenobites, are former drug couriers with sadomasochistic tendencies that took a tainted batch of LSD cooked up by a certain chemist. The bikers and cult break into their secluded house, stealing Mandy, but as Jeremiah attempts to seduce her with his music, Mandy laughs in his face, sending him into a rage. Taking revenge, Jeremiah stabs Red with a ceremonial blade before burning Mandy alive in front of him. Left to die, Red manages to squirm out of his makeshift shackles and is broken upon seeing the ashen remains of his wife. <laughs> out for revenge, he heads to his veteran friend Carruthers, played by none other than Bill Duke, and fetches the Reaper, his badass crossbow of death given to Carruthers for safekeeping. Despite his friend's warnings about the bloodthirsty skulls, the infuriated Miller goes to forge an equally demonic battle axe to meet them head on. An axe which, interestingly, was based on the F in the logo for Swiss metal band Celtic Frost. As he heads out, we're hit by the film's title card two thirds of the way through the film, signaling that things are about to get real. And boy, do they. Red manages to cripple one of the bikers with his crossbow before ramming it, but the seemingly supernatural demon flips his car like a toy and puts him in the familiar situation of being tied up. Following the destruction of his favorite shirt, the vet turns the tables, freeing himself and delivering vengeance on the terrifying clan. And yes, he was really obsessed with that shirt. You're in my shirt! You're in my shirt! Ah! 
After making short work of them, he takes some of the tainted LSD which trips him out hard, presenting him with the vision of a radio tower. Following this hallucination, Red finds the chemist who points him in the direction of the children of the new dawn. What follows is one man's unbridled retribution on a group that callously took away the only semblance of peace he had found in a world of chaos and death. Hey. Heartbreakingly, as the film closes, he rides off into the night, imagining Mandy in the passenger seat. But despite his revenge, nothing will bring her back. They lit her on fire! They were weirdo hippie types. Whole bunch of them. Mandy is a strange dreamlike experience. Its wild gorefest finale is set up by a slow burning introduction, which lasts for much of the runtime. The weighting of these plot points is used to put us in a trance while not so subtly discussing the opposition between love and subservience. At the beginning, Mandy and Red find themselves living more or less the perfect lives, at least given their circumstances. Both characters discuss dark pasts, Mandy of potential familial scars and Red of possible alcoholism, drug abuse and PTSD from the war, but are able to overcome this thanks to the mutual support of a loving, wholesome relationship built on respect, awe and love. This form of love is directly questioned in the film by Jeremiah, who confronts Red, exclaiming that the love of his followers is stronger. To show such quote-unquote affection, Jeremiah forces Sister Lucy to play Russian Roulette, perhaps not what most of us think of when we think about love. But this is at the very core of the film's discussion, contrasting Red and Mandy's bilateral equal love with Jeremiah's unilateral form of love, which is perhaps better identified as subservience and control. Jeremiah Sand paints himself as a new saviour, you know what Jesus' big mistake was? Huh? He didn't offer up a sacrifice in his stead. Ah. The cruciform is a constant reminder of that. Placing him firmly in the throne of power as a leader to be followed and loved, but without the expectation of that love ever been reciprocated. While there are many examples of cult leaders in the real world known for manipulating people into committing atrocities, the reality which Mandy most clearly resembles is that of the Manson family. Headed by Charles Manson in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the group were known for their use of hallucinogenic drugs, bizarre ideologies, and many home invasion murders. Like Jeremiah, Manson was considered by many in the family to be a manifestation of Jesus Christ, and many of its members gained religious names like mother, sister, and brother. And much like Manson, Jeremiah Sands places himself at the core of his followers' lives. By stripping members of any autonomy and forcing them to rely on them for direction, both were able to develop a dangerous cult of personality and brainwash the lost under their spell and to doing unspeakable things. With amazing performances across the cast, pulsating cosmic energy, spellbinding cinematography, and Nicolas Cage being an international treasure, Mandy cuts to the core of cultish doctrines with a heavy metal battle axe. The film's conclusion sees Red's bilateral love of Mandy come out victorious over the cultish assertions of unilateral subservience and control, but despite his victory, Mandy is gone. As our hero rides off across the cosmic landscape, we're left wondering if this broken entity of vengeance will ever find peace again. I like Galactus. Galactus isn't a planet. Yeah, but he eats planets. <laughs> Well, that's all for today, folks. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe to stay up to date on all my content. And uh, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. That was my favorite shirt.